Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be going through the hydrological cycle for your A-level in environmental science. To go with this we've written an example, 25 mark essay, where we take the content from this and apply it to the essay question similar that you would get in your exam. So you can go and watch that one next, if you're in the playlist then it's going to be the next one down, or if you're in the master class of the week, it's going to be in the next section down. You can look at how we structured our AO1, our AO2, then our Pyros, how we link it all together, and then of course you can have a guide to free flashcards and free questions. Lesson eight, the hydrological cycle. The hydrosphere. The hydrosphere is one of the main reservoirs on the earth and it contains all of the earth's water in solid, liquid and gas forms. This includes lakes, rivers, ice, snow and water vapour. The chemical formula for a water molecule is H2O, so it is made up of two hydrogen atoms joined to an oxygen. Water molecules join together via hydrogen bonds, which are weak bonds individually, but strong in great numbers. The number of these hydrogen bonds present determines whether water is in a solid, liquid or gas state. For example, ice contains a lattice structure of many hydrogen bonds which tightly pack the water molecules together. The state of water is changed by the temperature it is experiencing at the time. At 100 degrees Celsius or higher, liquid water will boil and evaporate to form water vapour. At 0 degrees Celsius or lower, liquid water will freeze to become solid ice. This all occurs within a narrow temperature range of 100 degrees, allowing processes in the water cycle to happen within the temperatures experienced on Earth. You will notice on the diagram that the different atoms within the water molecule carry different charges. The oxygen carries a slight negative charge, whilst hydrogen carries a slight positive charge. For this reason, we can describe water as dipolar, two charges, and it is the reason for one of the most environmentally significant properties of water, being a universal solvent. Water can dissolve all charged compounds and allows chemical reactions to happen faster in solutions such as photosynthesis and respiration. The two charges in the water molecule attract atoms of opposite charges. For example, in salt, the positive sodium is attracted to the oxygen and the chlorine is attracted to the positive hydrogen, dissolving the molecule. Plants and animals rely on water to dissolve substances that they transport around their bodies in xylem and blood vessels respectively. It also allows organisms to use water as a habitat and obtain nutrients from it. For example, filter feeders such as mussels in the ocean. Another environmentally significant property of water is its high specific heat capacity. This essentially means that it requires a large amount of energy to change the temperature even by one degree. Consequently, water makes a stable habitat in lakes and rivers as well as creating a stable internal environment for living organisms. Furthermore, water's solid form is less dense than its liquid form, which is very rare. This allows ice to flow on water and is important as it stops whole water bodies freezing in the colder months and the layer of ice almost acts like an insulator to allow wildlife to continue living under the surface. There are lots of keywords you need to be happy with from your GCSE science when talking about the movement of water through the hydrological cycle. These include evaporation, condensation, precipitation and transpiration. Evaporation is when water turns from a liquid to a gas. Condensation is the opposite process, so from a gas to a liquid. Precipitation is any form of water falling from the sky, for example rain, snow and sleet. Transpiration is the process where water evaporates from the leaves of plants to become water vapour in the atmosphere. It is an essential part of allowing plants to take up water from the soil. Before we take a look at the water cycle, I want to introduce you to a very important term that will be used across the whole environmental science course, dynamic equilibrium. This is when processes are in a state of balance, so end up cancelling each other out. All natural cycles exist in a state of dynamic equilibrium. Unfortunately, human activity ends up unbalancing this state. This is a key term that you need to be adding to your glossaries. The water cycle. Heat from the sun causes water to evaporate from water bodies, such as the ocean and lakes, to become water vapour in the sky. Trees also transpire, which has the same effect. 
This water vapour has to cool so it can condense back into a liquid and form precipitation. Precipitation falls onto land or sea. Trees can reduce the amount of rainfall hitting the ground at once through the process of interception by their leaves. This reduces soil erosion. If the soil is aerated and permeable, then the water will infiltrate down through the surface soil particles and percolate into deeper layers of soil and rock to join groundwater flow and water table, which will eventually reach the ocean. On the other hand, if the soil is compacted and impermeable, the water will run off, which is where it runs over the soil and eventually enters any nearby water bodies. This can be very damaging to the soil and lead to flooding in rivers and lakes due to the sudden influx of a large amount of water. When the precipitation reaches a water body, the cycle can then start again, when it evaporates due to the heat from the sun or taken up by plant roots and transpired. For your exam, you may be asked to label missing processes in the hydrological cycle, so ensure you are happy with what each process involves and where it happens. You could also be asked about some of the reservoirs in the cycle. Remember, a reservoir can be defined as a store of water. The largest reservoir of water on Earth is the oceans, followed by land ice and then groundwater. The average amount of time that water will remain in a reservoir is called the residence time. Remember it like the amount of time the water is living there. The largest residence times are the oceans and groundwater, followed by land ice. If given a cycle in the exam, you may be asked to calculate the residence time and you will need to use the following equation. The volume in the reservoir divided by the mean transfer rate. The mean transfer rate can be described as the volume of water moving in or out of a reservoir in a given amount of time. The unit should therefore be a unit of volume, for example, litres, followed by a unit of time, like a year. In order to use water sustainably, we need to know the different residence times, so we know how to manage the different reservoirs accordingly. So now we have looked at the processes in the water cycle, we need to look at where the energy comes from to drive the processes. This is from the sun. The heat from the sun allows water to evaporate and become a gas in the atmosphere, which drives the whole cycle. Once in the atmosphere is water vapour, this energy is converted into gravitational potential energy when stored in clouds before being converted into kinetic energy as the water falls to the earth. Here is an energy conversion flowchart to demonstrate this. Solar energy, heat, to gravitational potential energy, to kinetic energy. Another possible question you could be asked in the exam regarding the hydrosphere is to organise the processes into inputs, outputs and through flow. Inputs are processes that bring water onto the Earth's surface. Outputs are processes that remove water from the Earth's surface, whilst through flow are processes that help water move across the Earth's surface. And here are some examples of these. For the final part of our video, we're going to look at how human activities alter the processes in the hydrological cycle. Thinking back to what we said earlier, remember that naturally these processes would exist in a state of dynamic equilibrium. So for example, the amount of water entering via the inputs would be equal to the amount of water leaving through the outputs. Human activity alters the rate of transfer between reservoirs as well as the volume of water in each reservoir, therefore upsetting this balance. The first human activity we're going to look at is deforestation. Removal of trees reduces the amount of transpiration that occurs, leading to reduced levels of precipitation in downwind areas. This could lead to droughts, which would mean difficulty in growing crops. Furthermore, removing the trees removes the canopy so the amount of interception is reduced, meaning more rain is hitting the ground. As a result, the soil can become waterlogged leading to more surface runoff and less infiltration. More rain hitting the ground also leads to an increased likelihood of soil erosion. Agricultural practices largely alter the water cycle. The use of heavy farm machinery such as ploughs and tractors compact the soil, making it less permeable. As a result, water infiltration decreases and surface runoff increases. This practice, as well as using chemical pesticides, can reduce the population of soil biota, such as worms, which usually create tunnels and help infiltration. Irrigation is the large-scale watering of crops. This is one of the largest demands for water across the globe, reducing the volume of water stored in reservoirs. 
Furthermore, due to the sheer volume of water applied, a lot of it is excess and doesn't infiltrate into the soil, so cannot be taken up by plants. Instead, it ends up evaporating, increasing the amount of water vapour in areas downwind. Urban development and the use of impermeable road surfaces, such as tarmac, reduce infiltration and increase surface runoff. Rapid runoff from large areas can lead to flooding of natural reservoirs or of the drainage systems put in place in the city. The next human impact we are going to look at is global climate change. The rising temperatures we are seeing across the globe are increasing the rates of snow and ice melt and evaporation, whilst reducing the ability of water to condense back into rain. This is altering water availability across the earth and leading some areas into droughts and others into floods. The snow and ice melt is causing further warming through a positive feedback mechanism as more UV is being absorbed by the Earth's surface. And if the ice or snow was on land, the meltwater will contribute to sea level rise when it flows into the oceans. Ouch! This is why in some videos I write explain scratches.